Well, um, so just again, starting in the book of Acts, uh, we will be looking uh, at three different individuals later on. Uh, but I want to, before we do that, give another quick synopsis of what we've covered. Again, I mentioned earlier that Luke, the apostle, was the author of the book of Acts, and he offers us a view and a look into the lives of the first century church as Christ followers, also known as people of the way. And uh, that'll pop up here in a little bit. But we started out really looking at uh, Acts chapter 2, and we looked at the community of believers and some of the things that uh, they were doing as the first century church. They devoted themselves steadfastly to uh, four areas, okay? Four areas of focus. The apostles' doctrine or teachings, instructions, if you will. The breaking of bread, having a meal together. Uh, also, the Lord's Supper. They uh, devoted themselves in, to an area of focus on fellowship, or koinonia is another term uh, that is common, but just basically fellowship, coming together, increased communication, you know, not just Facebook back and forth, not just texting, but actual face to face connection, communication, right? Was the, the fellowship, the koinonia. And then uh, the fourth area was prayer. It was constant prayer, prayer, prayer. Now, I'm going to do a little side note here uh, because the Lord was speaking to my heart, and I'm going to issue a charge to you guys, grandparents and parents especially, those that have little ones in the vicinity of your home or your influence, right? Here's a tough question right off the bat I want to ask you because I feel like the Holy Spirit asked me, and then I needed to share it with you. Do your kids know you as a praying parent or a praying grandparent? Is that part of the makeup of their household? When they think about my mom, my dad, my grandma, my grandpa, whoever it is, do they see you and can they identify you as a praying parent? person. And I'm not just talking about the wee little ones that we say prayers for them at nighttime, which is very important. But I'm talking about even teenagers and grown adults. Do they still see you even at the latter seasons of your life as praying parents and grandparents? If not, I want to encourage you, seek the Lord And ask him, say, God, why is it that I don't example a lifestyle of prayer? Do I need to do more? Because this concept, when we talk about devoting and continuing steadfastly in prayer, it was part of the DNA. It was part of the makeup within the household and within the community that there were always people praying together. And so I want to encourage us, make prayer a part of, of your household identity. Does that make sense? And prayer doesn't have to be some big major ordeal. I remember in college, and again, I'm kind of sidetracking here, but I think it's very important. God cares more about the realness and authenticity of our hearts when we pray. There is definitely times whenever we intercede and maybe there's inner groanings and there's there's even volume, if you will, where we're doing spiritual warfare and certain things. That's all valid and important and part of the balance. But in your day-to-day moderation of life, are you abiding in Him? Are you praying to Him, seeking His face? And are those within your household able to witness that? And again, it's not a showboaty thing. This isn't like to glorify yourself in the moment, but out of sincerity, with sincere hearts, praying and exampling that lifestyle. Because if we don't example that to the younger generation, the likelihood of them passing that on to the next generation all the more decreases, right? And we don't want that. We want to continue going after passionately. What does Jesus say about... He'd rather us be either hot or cold, not to be lukewarm, lest 
he spit us out of his mouth. That's pretty, pretty strong words there, right? Well, I want to be passionate. I want to be hot. I want to burn brightly for our Heavenly Father. Amen. So pray, pray, pray. So important. So Acts 2.46, it said this, Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. We really spent a lot of time last week talking about that, thinking about Thursday coming ahead, of uh, Thanksgiving, and coming together, having glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. They had something to be thankful for, right? There had been fulfilled promises, anticipation, and then action was taking place and people's needs were being met. Now, throughout all of this, we see different times where Peter steps up and he has the boldness and he speaks forth the truth and the gospel message and he uses every opportunity to point back to Jesus and to share the good news message. And when he did that, almost every time there was opposition. There was somebody that did not like what he had to say. And so sometimes Peter and John were imprisoned and released, and then they rejoiced, and, and that empowerment led to even more action. I mean, it was just like a supercharge, right? You know, I almost wonder if they went to prison sometimes to get charged back up, right? Because there was something powerful that was happening. And of course, we have the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which without that, I seriously doubt that Peter and the disciples would have had the ability to carry that gospel message to the level in which they did. Thus, why Jesus said, go and wait for the promise of my Father, which was sending of the Holy Spirit, right? So we fast forward to Acts 4, 32. I'm kind of going through this quickly to get to the, the meat of the message, if you will. But Acts 4.32, the action, intentionally finding a need and meeting it, finding a hurt and healing it. We talked about that. And uh, if you look again, I'm going to look at Acts 4.32. And it reads this way. It says, All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions were their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. Isn't that amazing? I mean, that just still is amazing to me. Even Jesus said, the poor will be with you always, right? So there's that element of society where we recognize that, hey, there's always going to be need. There's always going to be struggle but within the first century church, the koinonia, the fellowship, the community, the value that everyone had for one another in such a manner to where there was no need among them. Oh, that the church would be able to exist to that level again today. You know what it takes, though? It takes community. It takes transparency. It takes willingness to swallow pride. And it takes willingness to do even what Micah said and we prayed about using the funds and the resources, the blessings the Lord sends into the storehouse for us to help meet those needs according to God's purposes and plans, right? So we have to frame our mind a little different than per se our Western churchy world mindset and say, God, what is it that you are speaking to us through your scripture. Can we be intentional, like I said last week, in finding hurts and healing them, letting the Lord flow through us to help heal those wounds, and then finding needs and meeting those needs, right? So we see this, and it says, For from time to time those who own land or houses sold them, brought the money from the cells, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need says, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. And so you see this anticipation led not just to them sitting back on their haunches and waiting for blessing, but no, they took action, right? Because there was care and love that motivated them for one another, to desire to help meet one another's needs. 
to grow as the body, right? Not just about what do we get out of it, but how can we be a blessing one to another? So we're going to fast forward. I know that there's a pretty amazing story here of Ananias and Sapphira. You're welcome to go back and look at that. But I want to highlight three different individuals, and this is where I'm doing a sprint through the message, if you will, of three individuals that the Lord really spoke to my heart that we can't leave the book of Acts until we cover these three aspects or these three individuals. And that's Gamaliel, Stephen, and Saul slash Paul. Okay? Now, how many of y'all know a lot about Gamaliel? No? Can't wait to share about Gamaliel. How many of y'all have heard of Stephen? Okay? And then, of course, we know Saul, the Persian, the conversion to Paul, right? So, three different lessons we're going to highlight this morning about these individuals. The first one takes place in Acts chapter 5, okay? So, we see here in verse 17, there's been a lot of things that have been happening, even going up uh, in verse 12 of chapter 5, the apostles were performing many signs and wonders among the people. They were being the church. They were meeting needs. God was empowering them. There were signs and wonders that were following them. Amazing things, right? But it didn't set well, again, with the high priests. And so you look down at verse 17. It says, Then the high priest and all his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in public jail, right? So it's a continual cycle that the apostles are finding themselves, right? Now, I'm going to get ahead of myself just for a moment because this concept of persecution, remember how I said I I wanted us to filter this uh, series through promises fulfilled and promises expected? Well, persecution unfortunately, is part of the promises. That's kind of hard for us to wrap our mind around as the Western church where we have been so overly, thankfully, abundantly blessed. But Jesus did say, you will have trial. You will have tribulation. It's not going to be a cakewalk. Not even a pie cakin, okay? So... It's not going to be necessarily easy. In fact, part of the anticipation is wrapping your head around the fact that there is going to come persecution along with it. Now, it's not to say that we look forward to persecution and that we go out looking for persecution, but it is to say that if and when it happens, We don't let that shake us to the core, and we especially don't let it shake us off of our Lord and Savior as our foundation. So we see here, again, the uh, the apostles are persecuted, and they're jailed. And it's amazing, though, because in those moments, even when they're jailed, there's still miracles happening. I mean, there's angels that are coming and freeing them out of prison, and then they're going back to the other uh, church to the to the first century church and giving testimony of the miracles of what God is doing. I mean, there, I can't even imagine some of the things. Could you imagine the front line, headline stories of 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 people that are being arrested, thrown in jail, and then the next thing you know they've escaped, but it's not you know in their own doing, but they're claiming that God set them free. This was commonplace. This was beginning to be the news of the day, and it was frustrating. The Sadducees and the high priest and those, right? So in verse 27 of chapter 5, it says, the apostles were brought in. This is, again, after they had miraculously gotten out of jail. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. And we're going to read this dialogue real quick. It says, we gave you an order, strict orders not to teach in this name. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teachings and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. This is the high priest, of course, addressing the apostles, particularly Peter in verse 29. It says, Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God 
rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Okay, that's, man, I mean, Peter, you, they were so in charge. They were, they were powerful, right? To be able to have the responses. Verse 33 says, When they heard this, being the high priest, the Sanhedrin, they were furious. And they wanted to put them to death. That's not like, hey, we're going to discipline you and smack your hand. Let's throw them back in jail. They were so angered by Peter's response. They wanted to put them to death. Let's go. Let's stone them. Let's get rid of these guys, right? But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, the teacher of the law who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin. Okay, so one of their own, somebody that was highly respected and honored, said, send the men out, I have something to say. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin. Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Theodos appeared claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. Now, in comparison, how many people were already following the way? Based on, I mean, we're talking thousands of people, right? The church. So here, here's a comparison. He says, you know, 400 people rallied to him. He was killed and all his followers were dispersed. And it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed and all his followers were scattered. So there's this pattern, right? That Gamaliel is noticing. So he speaks this. It's logic out of an unlikely source, not a place that you would normally find it, right? But he says this in verse 38. It says, therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. Oh, that's so powerful, right? What truth came out of his mouth in that moment? Verse 40, it says, His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Well, they've been doing that, haven't they? But isn't that amazing? Here they were, one moment, they're ready to just annihilate them, send them to their death. And Gamaliel stands up, says, you know, if this is of human origin, it's doomed to fail. But this is, if this is God, there's no stopping this. And you'll only find yourself fighting against God, Right? So here's an application I want us to take. Lesson one from Gamaliel. Are there areas in your life that God has spoken to you about? Maybe dreams to be fulfilled that you are still waiting on. Maybe even the struggle, if you will, of faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Don't find yourself fighting against God. If these things are of God, they will succeed. If they're of your own doing and your own makeup, then let them be what they are. But if it is authored by God, embrace it. Have faith. Don't fight. Spiritual maturity increases as you learn to pick your battles. 
There are some things that we war against that God never intends us to war against. We take burdens upon ourselves and we go after things and all the while God is saying, okay, but guess what? That's of your own origin. If we stay intact, even what Nicole was saying, that first song that we sing, we will, you know, you'll never let us down. If we are in step with God the Father, we can have confidence that our steps and where we're going, what we're doing, even if it doesn't turn out initially the way that we expect it, if it's of God and he's the author of it, he will bless it. And it'll be purposeful for his kingdom, right? So here's the takeaway from that first lesson. Fighting against God is a waste of time. So if you're fighting against God and you're struggling, it's a waste of time. I encourage you, don't fight. Have faith. Move with the tide, with God, in step with Him. Follow the flow of the river and its purposes because He is going to fulfill His desires one way or another. And you can either go along for the ride or you can go kicking and screaming, but I'd rather go along for the ride, right? I don't want to fight against God. So we're going to move on to our next person. Aren't you thankful for Gamaliel? That's a fun one to say, right? Because he stood. I want to say this too. God can even use those that we think are opposed to us to speak out the truth in certain situations. It's amazing how God can turn things around. And here in this situation, the apostles were freed to be able to continue to take next steps on what God was doing here. So we look at uh, Acts 7. And just prior to that, for context, before we introduce Stephen, you know, in chapter 6 of the book of Acts, the church was having some struggle. Ministry can get kind of ugly sometimes, right? I mean, it's just a part of it. You start having that many people, you're also going to have that many opinions and ideas that you're going to have to filter through and figure out. And so the apostles were given the responsibility of selecting a few people, seven particular, to help out in aiding and taking care of the widows. And so in that process, they selected Stephen. And if you look at chapter 6, verse 5, it says, They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And then it lists some others. And then verse 7, it says, So the word of God spread, and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So we have this introduction of Stephen. And he is faithful. And he is full of faith in the Holy Spirit. And he is going to be one of these that is going to be a servant of the Lord. And in verse 8 it says, Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. So there was starting to be word about Stephen and his faithfulness and some of the mighty things that God was using him for. And it says that in verse 9, opposition arose. Isn't it amazing when we start glorifying God and whenever things start happening, the enemy does not like it. We can almost anticipate that there is going to be opposition when we proclaim and lift up the name of Jesus and start act, doing action in his name that brings about good fruit. So in verse 12... It says, they seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin, and they even produced false witnesses. They wanted to try to trap Stephen so that they would have merit or reason to be able to put him to death. So they even created false witnesses to speak up against uh, Stephen. And so he's there before the Sanhedrin in chapter 7. Again, I, I encourage you to go back and read but Stephen, in the way that he spoke to the Sanhedrin with such power and wisdom and recollection of the story from beginning to the current of the gospel message and his proclamation of who Jesus was, it's amazing how it affected um, the people there. And verse 51 is where we're fast-forwarding. Acts chapter 7, 51, it says, You stiff-necked people, this is Stephen talking to 
the uh, Sanhedrin, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. Of course, he's speaking of Jesus. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through angels but have not obeyed it. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. Man, those Sanhedrin, they just got upset all the time, didn't they? Just constantly furious and angry and just mad. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus, standing at the right hand of God, Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragging him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. Introduction, Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Where have we heard that before? When he had said this, he fell asleep. In other words, he died. He perished, right? This is key here. And Saul approved of their killing him. All right, Saul. So we have Saul introduced here. So back to Stephen. So Stephen was a convinced servant and the first martyr for his faith. Stephen counted the cost and was willing to pay the price. He did not cower down. He did not just give in to the whims and the wishes of the Sanhedrin. He spoke boldly and faithfully and truthfully of what God had done in his heart, even to the point to where they were going to stone him, and they did, in fact, do that. Have you asked yourself the tough questions? One of them being, particularly, would you be willing to die for your faith? That's not a fun question, but it's one that has real application that one has to have in their heart and in their mind made up. Are you willing to die for your faith? Again, it's kind of a rewiring of our mind because here in America, we're so blessed. Persecution to us is not being able to go to church, per se. And I'm not saying that's that's not persecution. I'm just saying the level and the intensity of what kind of gets our goat or we struggle with is a lot different than what even the first century church dealt with. But realize this. We have brothers and sisters in the faith, in the family of God around this beautiful globe, even as I am preaching this message that are asking themselves that very real question of do I have enough faith that I would be willing to die for my faith in Jesus Christ? Because there are men and women that are dying today because of their faith, that are continuing to be martyrs in the faith. Sometimes it is healthy to pause long enough to reflect and remember those who are truly suffering as a result of their faith. Proper perspective is very sobering. I love being able to come together and to fellowship and experience worshiping the Lord with with my brothers and sisters in the faith. It takes it on a whole other level if we were having to do this in secret under a guise of of uh, uh, an underground church, if you will. 
it would put it in a whole other perspective that literally there were armed vehicles surrounding this place. That at any point in time, if they found out that we had one of these, or that we proclaimed Jesus, or that we sang songs, that if we stepped out, that we could be arrested and potentially tried and even potentially die for our faith. It would take it to a whole other level. And I know that's kind of gloomy and sobering, but that is truth. That is what our world experiences in so many places. All the more why they value and cherish God's word and the beauty that it contains, right? So the takeaway, praying for our brothers and sisters who are being persecuted and dying for their faith in the same Jesus we worship is always worthy of our time. The Holy Spirit reminds you and says, hey, be praying for your brothers and sisters in the faith. Do it. You never know what can be happening in the spirit. Again, persecution is a part of the promise. It's part of the plan. It's not easy to swallow, but it is the real deal. And in the meantime, all the more how thankful we should be and how blessed we are to live in a country where we do still have the freedoms to gather and to worship, to peaceably assemble. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Acts 9, we continue on. We had an introduction of Saul, right? So we're going to fast forward. And we see this amazing story of Saul and his conversion. Now, I'm going to highlight this. This is really a true story of an opponent turned advocate, right? We have Saul, who is a complete opponent of the people of the way, the first century church. And after his encounter with God, he becomes one of the biggest advocates for the movement of the first century church, right? So we see here... Uh, before we get into 9, I'm going to read this real quick. An interesting little info fact. Saul's name wasn't changed at the point of conversion. Uh, I know many of us have thought, even I have thought at times, well, when, when, God, when Saul met God on the road to Damascus, his name was changed to Paul. That wasn't, that wasn't the case. In fact, Saul's name wasn't changed. His name was also Paul. The custom of dual names was common in those days. Acts 13.9 describes the apostle as Saul, who was also called Paul. From that verse on, Saul is always referred to in Scripture as Paul. Paul was a Jew born in the Roman city of Tarsus. He was proud of his Jewish heritage, as he, descri as he describes in Philippians 3.5. Circumcised on the eighth day of the race of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrew parentage, in ob observance of the law of a Pharisee. So zealous and devout was he that persecuting Christians was the natural way for him to show his devotion. He chose to use his Hebrew name Saul until, someone, until sometime after he began to believe in and preach Christ. After that time, as the apostle to the Gentiles, Romans 11.13, he used his Roman name, Paul. It would make sense for Paul to use his Roman name as he traveled farther and farther into the Gentile world. And we know he was one of the greatest missionaries. So that, in large part, was the transition of him using his name Saul to using his name Paul. So it's interesting because I've always, I thought that he was given a new name. You know, that's kind of always been the correlation. But the truth is, he, he was named Paul, Saul and Paul, but he utilized it for different purposes. So we see here, though, again, the conversion in chapter 9. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest 
and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. He replied, now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus, and for three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Okay, so this is the famous story that we see of this moment, this encounter where Saul encounters Jesus in the voice of God. And it says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And, and Saul is like, who are you, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now, this, this didn't just have a spiritual effect on Saul. It had a physical effect. It said that that light was so bright that it blinded him. Now, I haven't ever had a flash of light that bright that blinded me for an extended period of time. But we've all had a flash of light, maybe when you were waking up in the morning and somebody flips on the light real quick. and it's like, uh. You know, we have those moments, but this was so powerful that it literally blinded uh, Saul. And it says that those that were around him heard the sound. There was something physical in that moment that was so powerful. And of course, we know that Saul interpreted it as the voice of God speaking to him. But it says that the sound, um, that it left the men traveling with Saul speechless. Now, Saul wasn't just this little carry-on guy that was just happened to be with him. He was a leader. And now they're seeing their leader totally, you know, knocked down to the ground, blind, and they heard this sound, and they see him desperate. And, and all of a sudden they're saying, let's help get him up. We've got to carry him into Damascus. Now, we fast forward the story. We know that the Lord also was speaking to Ananias and told Ananias to go and find Saul or to receive Saul. And Ananias had heard about Saul's persecuting of the church and was pretty hesitant at first. But yet he then obeyed, right? And we see in verse 17, it says, Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. This is so good. In verse 20, it says, At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Wow. Powerful, right? So here's the takeaway, all right? The lesson, application. Do you remember your conversion moment? Did you have an encounter with God that dramatically and radically changed your life? Realize you have a gift of testimony, just like Saul and just like Luke documented of that conversion, that transformation. It is to be shared, that testimony that you have. It has the potential to spark the fire in someone else's life. The Holy Spirit wants to use your story as part of God's kingdom plan. A genuine encounter with God contains the potential for life-altering transformation in you and possibly those around you. Amen? Here's the takeaway. Encounters with God require God to be a part of the equation. 
There's a lot of people seeking out spiritual things, looking for a feeling, looking for an emotional fix, but only a true encounter with God as a part of the equation can bring about transformation. Long-lasting transformation, right? He wants to meet with you right where you are. Your testimony is a part of his promise and plan being fulfilled. So here's our conclusion takeaway, okay? Number one, fighting against God. What we learned from Gamaliel, fighting against God is a waste of time. Don't, don't waste your time. Go with God. Be faithful. Have faith in who he is and in his promises. Remember to pray for our brothers and sisters in the faith that are being persecuted, even as we speak. And thirdly, remember your testimony is a part of His promise and plan being fulfilled. Share it often. It could be the catalyst to transforming hearts around you towards Jesus Christ, right? So we said all of this was, this whole series was to be taken through the filter of promises fulfilled and promises expected. As we have taken a brief look at the early church through the eyes of Luke, we have witnessed the birthing of the church, God's empowerment through the Holy Spirit, exponential growth, right? Continuing to have it spread, just as Jesus said. God's empowerment and the community of the believers, the common unity of the people coming together. Persecution. And now a few individual stories of transformation. The hope that we have is that God can redeem even the strongest opponent and transform them into his greatest advocate. It is our turn now to be transformed and to be led by him. Amen? Let's stand and pray. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we love you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the example of those that have gone before us. Our brothers and sisters in the faith that even as we are here gathered, they might be facing a death sentence because of their faith in who you are. So Lord, we pray for them. Just as Stephen looked up to heaven and took comfort in seeing you, Jesus, I pray that you would empower them to carry through, to be faithful all the way to the end, and to demonstrate your love. God, I pray that you would help us in our lives to share our testimony, our God encounter moments that have been so transformational in our lives that it will point back to Jesus, point back to who you are, and that it would give you glory and honor. Lord, again, I thank you for each one that's here today. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would use this word that's been spoken and that you would remind us of each of these different ones and that we can find some of that in our own lives and apply it accordingly. We love you. We ask you to go with us, protect us, be with our loved ones, keep us safe. Help us to be a blessing to those around us this week and to truly show your love to those around us. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen. Bless y'all, and uh, remember next Sunday, fellowship here. uh, Still come about the same time. We won't eat right at 11, but uh, we'll definitely be getting everything set up and, and prepared.